Cleopatra was a woman of state, extremely powerful, extremely intelligent. I have never seen such a magnificent collection of artifacts anywhere outside of Egypt. We are shocked every day by what we are finding. For thousands of years, the world has been captivated by the legend of Cleopatra. Recently, a team of underwater archaeologists unearthed ancient artifacts that belong to Cleopatra from the bottom of the ocean floor off the coast of Egypt. More than 150 of these objects are part of a new exhibit that opened at the California Science Center in Los Angeles, and I got a chance to see it for myself. Joining me here today is the amazing Dr. Frank Godio, all the way from Paris. He is the underwater archaeologist that's responsible for this amazing exhibition. Welcome, Dr. Frank. Oh, it's a pleasure because uh, I am able to see the object I have seen underwater at their best here. We're so pleased that we're here to uncover and to discover Cleopatra. When did your curiosity for Cleopatra start? Well, of course, uh, Cleopatra, it's a kind of a ghost over all that region, you know. It's very strange because it's maybe one of the most well-known pharaohs, the last one, and all statues have disappeared. Her name has been erased from the monument, and there is nearly nothing left from her. But everywhere you go, you go on site where she used to live, she used to pray, and she used to rule the world and you can feel it. And it's very, very emotional to find artifacts that she has seen, that she has even touched. Just looking at these magnificent pieces of gold, she must have been the richest woman in the world. She was the richest woman uh, of the world, of course. There is not a single square meter in Alexandria where you don't find gold, jewelry, beautiful jewelry. Some of them seem very modern. Uh, perfectly preserved because uh, the gold doesn't tarnish under water. Even in the salt water? That's Even incredible. in the salt water, uh, you can see them exactly like we found them under water after 2,000 years. And uh, it's true that all those objects, as they were living together, they were found together, they tell you a story that you can absolutely feel, mm -hmm. you see? Even as an Egyptian, Dr. Gaudio, I have never seen such a magnificent collection of artifacts anywhere outside Egypt. It's very emotional because they correspond to each other. Here you can see the two sphinx. One of them is the likeness of the father of Cleopatra. And they are guarding a statue which was in a small temple Cleopatra had nearby her palace. Why were the sphinx always half man, half lion? Why specifically the lion? They are the watcher the watcher of the flood and the keeper also of the temple and sanctuary. Beautiful. The majority of objects were discovered near Alexandria, what was then the capital of Egypt. This was the center of the science, culture, poesy, literature, and also politics, and the center of wealth. But this is so magnificent. I mean, even from here now, we can tell she had such a glamorous life. I want that life. <laughs> How long does a piece like that take to excavate? Well, that piece uh, it took us a week to excavate because it was uh, well buried under the sediment. Mm -hmm. And we did not want to touch it before, of course, performing all layers. Uh, in order to date it, to see when it fell, you know, and uh, you have to be careful be before raising it, an element. So how did the people of Egypt and the government of Egypt receive your news? They were fascinated and extremely interested because, uh, as you know, Egyptian uh, people are extremely fond of their culture. Yes, right? we are. It's <laughs> the greatest <laughs> culture in the world. That's, they are extremely proud of this. and and uh, the fact that we could discover sunken city several kilometers away from the prison coast of Egypt has been submerged because of uh, earthquake and tidal wave and totally disappeared. 
was extremely impressive for, uh, you know, for, um, to think that this could happen. And uh, they were extremely happy that we could uh, bring uh, back the history to life. Cleopatra was born in 69 BC and became queen at 17. She was determined to unify Egypt and used her famous lovers, Julius Caesar and Mark Antony, to help her. What is it that makes Cleopatra magnificent? Cleopatra was a character. She was extremely beautiful, extremely intelligent, but she was a woman of state. She was powerful and she knew how to rule and she had a dream and that dream was to unify the western world with the eastern world she knew that she could not do this by herself and she has she had to meet with somebody which would help and who could do that the imperator the roman imperator julius caesar thus she seduced caesar and she was able to pursue that dream with him until the time where he was assassinated. Thus, after she tried to go on with Mark Antony, but she knew from the very beginning that Antony uh, had not the genius of Caesar, and she knew this will not succeed. Uh, but she tried to save the kingdom of Egypt, and she could not do it. Cleopatra died at the age of 39 by taking her own life with a snake bite. It is a tragedy, and it's such, such a tragedy. It, yes, of course. It's, the end of Cleopatra is absolutely unbelievable, you know, unbelievable. What do you think of all the depictions of all the Hollywood films that have been depicting Cleopatra? I would think that the reality was even above that, Way much above that. above that. And this is something that we are finding in Alexandria and in the other sunken cities that we have discovered, is that everything is more beautiful, it's bigger and more intelligent to what have been thought to be and what was written to be. What we are finding is unbelievable. You know, the palaces are huge, are big, are so rich, you know, as a temple are... Colossal. Uh, colossus, colossus. And, uh, and uh, I presume that the luxury, uh, the way of life of that time was even more, I would say, extravagant than what can be shown in uh, the movie. These pieces are so beautiful, I want to wear them. Yes, yeah, they could be very modern, you know. I presume that you, if you wear them, uh, your friend will say, oh, what a nice jewelry you just bought, you know. It's magnificent. Uh, uh, yes, yes, uh, forever. <laughs> what kind of uh, stones here are these? Are uh, these rubies, pearls? rubies, pearls, and uh, well, gold. You said she was very intelligent, she was very beautiful, but to become queen at 17, was that her doing? Was that her father's doing? She was a tough lady. Mm -hmm. Most probably she assassinated her brother. <laughs> but in one sense, she was pursuing a dream, you know, and nothing could prevent her from her dream. Did she want to she, rule the world? She wanted to rule the world. It's a very modern uh, uh, dream. She was a powerful queen, uh, she wanted to have a strong empire, and she wanted to defend Egypt against colonization. But she was a woman of state. She was not kind at all. <laughs> I had always been fascinated with the life of Cleopatra. The more I saw in the exhibit, the more intrigued I became. She spoke several languages. Uh, she, uh, she wrote books about cosmetic, about presents. You said she's beautiful. How do we know this? The, the texts, all the texts mm. who are talking about her, say 
She is of an unbelievable charm. Mm. Her voice was irresistible. She's extremely intelligent. She's very beautiful. What happened to all of her children? One of them was brought, she was brought to Rome. And she was married with a prince of Mauritania. This is her daughter from Antonio? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thus, most probably, in Africa, you have descendant of Cleopatra, for sure. Wow. That gives me hope. <laughs> How was it possible for such a, an early civilization to build such huge and such complex structures? Cleopatra was in the, uh, the heir of uh, 3,000 years of civilization, which was Unbelievable, you know, uh, the temple in the old kingdom, in the new kingdom, was beautiful, huge, uh, impressive. And, uh, and uh, when she arrived and she took power, uh, there was uh, already, since two or three hundred years, a kind of mixture between the Egyptian culture and the Greek culture. Absolutely. Thus, uh, that mixture made something extremely special extremely refined, extremely civilized, I would say. What kind of Egypt did Cleopatra rule? Alexandria was, I would say, the most powerful city of the time, you know. It was in Alexandria where you have the science, the poesy, the literature, the politics, the, uh, the strength, the army, the, everything was there, total monarchy. What kind of material did they use? This is marble. They were using all type of uh, stone. Alabaster. Do you only find alabaster in Egypt? Uh, mostly in Egypt, yes. They were found of alabaster and they were uh, producing beautiful objects from alabaster. And this is a mirror who uh, looked herself in that mirror, we don't know. <laughs> this has been found in Alexandria on the Royal Quarters. But the actual glass itself? Uh, it there. was polished. Mm -hmm. uh, so well polished that the bronze was shining and reflecting wow. as, as a glass. Yeah. That much, yeah, yeah. huh? So they never actually used glass mirrors at the time? No, no at that time they were using uh, bronze mirrors. We are paving the way for future archaeologists who we work on those sites for centuries and maybe make some unbelievable discovery because most of the discovery are still ahead of us. And sometimes also solving 2,000 years mysteries. That's the fun, I think. One of the highlights of the exhibition is the discovery of the so-called lost cities of Canopus and Heracleion, which had been submerged underwater for more than a thousand years. Those cities were eaten. Uh, those cities were struck by natural disaster. Uh -huh. Tsunami. A tsunami and earthquake. Mm -hmm. And the whole area collapsed and disappeared under the water. This was around Cleopatra's time or before? This has happened several times hmm. before Cleopatra time and after Cleopatra time. And little by little, the whole region was submerged, but it totally disappeared in the 8th century AD. Dr. Godio and his team performed electronic geophysical surveys for years before they started excavating. It has taken more than two decades to map the area, develop the technology, find the items and bring them up from the ocean floor. We started the first excavation in Alexandria in 1996. And, but we are still working today. So today. Uh, we go back next month over there and uh, resume the work. We use uh, very sophisticated technology and we started to dive and to excavate. And uh, the first artifact that I found was on a what turned out to be the whole island where Cleopatra used to live, and under 2.5 meters of sediment. 
there was a shapeless block that I started to clean, and I, I could feel that there was something hard in the middle at the heart of that, uh, and it was red granite. And cleaning that block, I could feel that there was some inscription, hieroglyphic inscription, and I could read, live forever. Thus, I took it as a good omen. What would you say was your biggest challenge? The biggest challenge at the beginning was not to be taken as a crazy guy. Because <laughs> when you say, oh, I want to discover a sunken city, and I will, people are looking at you like that, and like, OK, fine. Maybe it's a little bit. Uh, Cuckoo. Yes, and OK, <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Then after, uh, you have, uh, of course, hypothesis based on uh, scientific element, but it takes years. What about the effects on your body of you being underwater under so much pressure for such a long time? Well, I, I don't know. I, I hope it preserved me because I need several hundred years <laughs> <laughs> to finish the job. You know. An exhibition of this size, how long did it take you to put together? Well, first 20 years to find the artifact, and then a few years to assemble, to restore the object, to study them. What is special with that e exhibition is that they were living together in the antiquity, and they are back now together here after 2,000 years. We wanted to show the environment of that object, and also how we discover them, how we excavated them, how we restore them, we leave them out of the water. Joining me now is Mark Lack, and he is the creative director for this amazing exhibition. Welcome, Mark. Oh, good to be with you, Amir. Thank you so much for all this beauty. This is magnificent. Well, it's, it's a lot of beauty, isn't it? I hope we've done something with creating an experience here, telling the story in a visual way, in a theatrical way that, that puts you there. Tell us about the main attraction here at your exhibit. We're telling three stories, aren't we? Uh, the story of Cleopatra. We know there isn't uh, much to be found with her image on it, uh, but we know now these three cities that were the cities where she worked, where she lived, where she played, where she worshipped. That's the one story, the, the main focus of Cleopatra. But we've got the story of Frank Gaudio, his work. You see that represented all throughout the exhibition in large graphics and videos. How do you start the layout and the design? Uh, a team decides, and the academics, the scholars, work on that first. Uh, we've presented an opening film that gives everyone the same starting point because people come with different expectations, different knowledge of the story. So that film, I think, brings everybody up to speed. And then that first reveal, I hope you're discovering the pieces much like Frank did. But then we're on our way. We go to Canopus, the city of Canopus, uh, into Heraklion, and finally in this area, uh, Alexandria. And that really tells Frank's story. That's the area where he's working. You've worked with Frank Gordia. What kind of a man is he? Oh, you know, in my job, you, if you can call it a job, it's a real privilege to work with the best. Really, he really cares for these objects. The pieces belong to Egypt, but in a way, he's got some ownership too. What would you say is your favorite artifact after all this? Boy, uh, you walk through every day and you, you have new ones every day. You know, you can look at, at the big pieces, the colossal statues, the king and the queen, and you're just amazed at that. It kind of puts you in that moment of, of walking in her world. But then you look at the small pieces, the jewelry, the coins with her image on the coins. Those are pretty fantastic. It always changes for me, I think. You spent most of your life studying Cleopatra. What fascinates you personally about her the most? She was a woman of state, which is rare. Uh, ruling the most powerful empire of her time, making alliance with other kingdoms. Traveling, she traveled to Rome, she lived to Rome. You know, she had a vision uh, which is totally different to the other ruler of that time. My favorite artifact maybe is the one which is 
behind us. You said Cleopatra for sure touched this. Yes, it's a shrine, which is the first astrological calendar in the world. And inside there was a statue. And once a year, there was a special ceremony where the pharaoh had to go to that temple, open the two doors of that shrine, and only pharaoh could open the door and pray in front of the statue. And of course, Cleopatra has gone to Canopus, has had opened that door and pray in front of that object. You said this is astrological. It's uh, engraved on uh, his surface. Is the cal Egyptian calendar. It's an extremely important monument. It is written on it that it is a magical monument. And it is written that it has an extreme power against whatever and whoever would like to harm Egypt. There is curse, very, very strong curse against the enemy of Egypt, if ever they do that. They, there is explanation of what will happen to them and you have, really, it's frightening. Astrology played a huge part in the pharaohs' lives. Astronomy and astrology, yes, absolutely. The Egyptians were unmatchable on astronomy. Every night on all Egyptian temples, you had people watching the sky and noting the position of the star on the planets. On all the temples in all Egypt during 3,000 years. Does anything ever shock you? We are shocked every day. <laughs> we are shocked every day by what we are finding. You, you cannot excavate in one square meter without finding some piece of gold, some piece of jewelry, some coins, some statues. As you're walking today through the exhibition, what goes through your mind? I think all those objects that I have seen underwater before they have been clean and raised uh, speak about a, a lost historical period. We are the heir of that period. We are the heir of those colossus and uh, of those people. As for what went through my mind, I was in heaven at the exhibit being so close to items Cleopatra touched, looked at, and maybe even looked in. When people come to see your wonderful exhibit here, Dr. Gordio, what do you want people to walk away with? First, I hope that they will dive into history and dive also underwater because you have an underwater ambience here. And they will be able to see objects that Cleopatra have seen during her time. They could maybe come close to some objects that she touched during her time. And uh, I hope that they will understand better the time and the way of living uh, of Cleopatra. Are there still a lot of artifacts yet to be unburied? I think we have not discovered more than 5% of what wow. uh, is on those places. And we will need several hundred years to finish the work because uh, there is not a single square meter without artifacts, ceramic, jewelry, coins, statues. That's, it's an, a handless job which is ahead of us. And maybe we find other artifacts which will explain even more uh, her time and her beauty and also the way she was living and ruling Egypt. I'm sure we will. I can't wait to see more. Panasonic is the official camera of the Africa Channel.